Hello and welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, today we have a very nice lineup of speakers and we will hear a lot about quantum error correction. So the first speaker of the session is uh, Christoph uh, Piveto uh, from uh, ETH and he will tell us about error mitigation for universal gates on encoded qubits. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be talking about this work today, uh, which was done in collaboration with uh, David Sutter, Sergei Bravi, Jay Gambetta, and Christian Temmel. So, um, let's see if the slide's going to continue. Right. So, before I start talking about the topic, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the terms error mitigation, error correction, what they what they mean and how they differ from each other. So for this purpose, I, I drew this very crude timeline of quantum computing. As, and as you can see on the left side, you already have quantum computers nowadays. They're unfortunately very noisy, which makes it extremely difficult to demonstrate any kind of quantum advantage on a useful task. So uh, we already know uh, how we're most likely going to want to solve this problem at some point in the distant future. We want to realize large scale universal uh, uh, fault tolerant quantum computing using quantum error correction by essentially coding our logical information in, in many physical qubits. And once we'll have such a quantum computer in the, in the distant future, we already have at least a few ideas what we could do with such a computer. So unfortunately, uh, realizing quantum error correction in, in hardware has proven to be extremely difficult in terms of num sheer numbers of physical qubits that you require, but also uh, in terms of gate fidelities. For that reason, it's probably still going to be quite some time before we have such a computer. And for this reason, in the recent years, the field of quantum error mitigation has gained a lot of, of, of uh, traction. So basically, error mitigation is just a, a collection of different techniques that try to reduce or remove the, the effect of noise in a more hardware-friendly manner. And when I say hardware-friendly, I just mean that it's easier to realize in practice than error correction. So, of course, these techniques are not meant to be a replacement for error correction. They all come with some kind of drawbacks. So either they're not generalizable or uh, they have some bad asymptotic scaling compared to error correction. They're more meant as a, as a, as a way to achieve some kind of quantum advantage uh, before reaching this error correction regime. So one example of, a, of a quantum error mitigation technique uh, is the probabilistic error cancellation, which is an instance of quasi-probability simulation. Uh, which will play a central role in my talk today. So in a few slides, I will explain in detail how it works. So if you take away one message from my talk today, uh, I think it should be following. Namely, that we believe that the transition from this error mitigation to this error correction regime is not going to be some clear-cut transition. In the sense that as soon as we know how to do error correction, we're not immediately going to forget about error mitigation. Uh, we rather believe that especially in the early days of error corrections, many ideas and techniques from error mitigation that we're developing nowadays will still play a, a, a central important role. In fact, the technique that I'm gonna to propose today is exactly designed to kind of smooth off this transition from error mitigation and error correction. In essence, by, by combining the best of both worlds or put a bit differently, we want to make error correction a little bit more hardware friendly by using error mitigation. So in order to explain how we can do that, I first want to um, talk about one of the major difficulties in actually realizing the, a large scale universal uh, fault tolerant quantum computer, and that's the realization of, of logical gates. So you can think of, of, of there being two types of gates, there's transversal and non-transversal gates. And so you can think of transversal gates as being the ones where, uh, that, that, that uh, you can realize by basically just coupling equivalent qubits in different code word blocks. So, because by definition, you know that you don't spread around too much noise in your system. These are pretty much automatically fault tolerant. And um, for many uh, codes that are commonly studied, uh, the Clifford gates or a subset of the Clifford gates uh, can be realized transversely. Unfortunately, Clifford gates are not universal. And the Easton Nil theorem tells us that uh, no uh, error correction code can implement a complete universal gate set transversely. That means we have to deal with non transversal gates in some form or another. And those are much harder and, and, and expensive to realize in practice. So one setting that's often considered in error correction literature is that we have some kind of error correction code that allows us to do Clifford gates uh, transversely. So we need one additional non-Clifford gate uh, in order to reach universality. And that's often considered to be the T gate. And to realize a, a fault tolerant T gate, you could, for instance, use a, a technique like magic state distillation, where you distill a, a certain magic state like this pi over four state here. And then you inject it into your circuit with, uh, with um, 
with a gadget like this. Um, unfortunately, this magic state distillation is expected to be extremely uh, expensive and difficult to, to realize in the hardware, especially in the early days of quantum error correction. And it's most likely going to be a, a, a quite, quite a big difficulty for experimentalists. And so in, in essence, the, the idea that I want to propose today is that we want to realize these logical T gates and thus re reach universality, not by making use of magic state distillation or something like this, but rather by using techniques from error mitigation. And more precisely, we're going to use probabilistic error cancellation, which I uh, mentioned in the, in, in the previous slide. So in essence, what we gain from that is that we can realize our logical T gate in a much more hardware friendly manner. And the price that we pay is that we pick up some of this bad asymptotic scaling that comes with error mitigation. So in order to explain how this is going to work, I first need to, to, to explain how probabilistic error cancellation works uh, in, in, the, in the regular uh, error mitigation setting. So uh, basically the setup that we have is that we have some kind of faulty uh, quantum computer that can only realize noisy operations, right? So for example, noisy quantum channels describing some, some noisy gates, or we could have uh, noisy measurements or combinations thereof. I call these uh, e, E1, E2, E3, and so on. And our goal is that we want to simulate some kind of ideal unitary gate, right? Some ideal uh, time evolution of, of one or multiple qubits uh, according to some unitary channel U. So the main ingredient that we're going to use in order to realize that simulation is a so-called quasi-probability decomposition. That means we want, in essence, we want to write our, our channel U as a sum of some coefficients AI times the, the quantum channels that our hardware can actually realize. So the quasi in quasi-probability here comes from the fact that this coefficient can actually possibly be negative. And uh, we measure that negativity with, with this gamma factor here, the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. And if you have a nice probabilistic mixture, for instance, that means you have no negativity at all, then your gamma factor is going to be one. And you, as soon as you have negativity in your uh, decomposition, gamma is going to be larger than one. So the way how we're now gonna simulate our ideal unitary gate is going to be with quasi-probability simulation. So the idea in essence is that we want to take these negativities out of these coefficients and put them into the observable, which will then allow us to do uh, Monte Carlo sampling. So this is a little bit abstract, what I just said now. So I'd like to illustrate that on the simplest possible example of, of uh, quasi-probability simulation. Let's consider that we have a very simple circuit consisting of uh, a single gate uh, U, right? That's the gate that we want to error mitigate, followed by some measurement of an observable O. And uh, the, the goal now of probabilistic error cancellation, what we want to obtain is the expectation value of that measurement outcome. So what we want to do, we want to take this, this quasi probability decomposition I had on the previous slide, and we'd like to make it look a little bit more like a probabilistic mixture. So what I'm going to do, I take these coefficients AI, I separate uh, the absolute value of AI times this sign of AI, right? And then I normalize the absolute values of AI by the, by the gamma factor, such that I precisely get a, a valid probability distribution PI. So I basically rewrote it with a little bit of algebra as a probabilistic mixture of some, of some terms here. And if I now insert that into the ideal expectation value of my circuit that I want to evaluate, I get a probabilistic mixture of certain terms that I can precise, that I can efficiently evaluate on my noisy quantum computer. So essentially I do some Monte Carlo sampling and by doing uh, as, as, as many shots as I, I want, I, I can get an arbitrary close uh, estimate of the true expectation value of my, of, of my circuit with my noisy quantum computer. So to be a little bit more concrete how this Monte Carlo sampling looks like in practice, uh, what, what's going to happen is that every time that I run a, a shot of my circuit, I'm gonna randomly replace my gate U by one of the channels EI that my noisy quantum hardware can actually realize. And the probability with which I choose the, the, the channel EI is exactly this probability PI that we have below here. And then at the end of my circuit, after I've uh, done the measurement, I weight my measurement outcome by this gamma times signum of AI factor. And if I do this many, many times and average the result, I can get again an arbitrarily close estimate to the true expectation value of my circuit, of the noise free circuit. And a, a very simple argument uh, shows that if you want to reach a, a certain desired accuracy of your uh, expectation value, the number of shots that you need to, to run is, it scales with the square of this gamma factor, which again is, is a measure of the negativity of our quasi-probability decomposition. 
So of course, this is now a, a very simple example. I only have one single gate in my circuit. This straightforwardly generalizes to, to, to the general setting where we have many gates in our circuit that we want to error mitigate. And when you think about it briefly, you will quickly notice that the negativities of your individual quasi probability decompositions of all the gates, uh, they combine in a multiplicative fashion, which means that the total sampling overhead to, to uh, error mitigate the complete circuit is exponential in the number of gates that you have in your circuit. So here you really see the, the advantages and disadvantages of error mitigation, right? So uh, the big advantage of, of, of probabilistic error cancellation is we can, in principle, completely remove the noise. Uh, without having to use any kinds of additional qubits in contrary to quantum error correction. And the price that we have to pay is uh, also a very hefty price, but it's a classical resource. We have to run uh, uh, much more shots of our circuits and in fact exponentially many in terms of our, of our gates. So um, at this point, I'd also like to make a very brief remark about experimental realizations of uh, probabilistic error cancellation. Unfortunately, while the theory sounds very nice, it's actually still rather difficult to realize this method in practice because essentially you have a, a hidden assumption hidden in it, in it, namely that you know the precise noise on your quantum hardware, which is something that in practice is not, is not the case. And if you want to figure out what noise you have on your hardware, you, you need to do lots and lots of tomography and doing tomography, especially on noisy devices, is extremely uh, difficult and expensive to get right. And for this reason, it's actually only been very recent, uh, January of this year, actually, uh, that I would say the first convincing realization of probabilistic error cancellation has been shown. So the reason why I'm mentioning this year is because when we're going to combine probabilistic error cancellation with error correction in a few slides, this problem of having to know the precise noise on our hardware will be significantly alleviated. So one big drawback of the probabilistic error cancellation will, will kind of disappear. Uh, probabilistic error cancellation and quasi-probability simulation. So as I mentioned in the introduction, the setting that we're considering here is that, is that we have some kind of near-term quantum error correction system, which doesn't have, doesn't support uh, any mag magic state distillation. Uh, so it means we can realize Clifford gates fault tolerantly, but we cannot realize T gates fault tolerantly. We can at most have some kind of noisy logical T gates. Now, the central idea of our technique is now extremely simple in principle. What we want to do is we want to take one of these noisy logical T gates and we want to error mitigate uh, the, the noise away, basically, using the probabilistic error cancellation, but now on, on a logical level. So um, the way I, how we have to do that is, as before, we have to find first a quasi-probability decomposition of our ideal noise-free T gate in terms of, of the operations that our uh, hardware can realize. And in this case, these are now uh, noise-free Clifford gates as well as uh, a noisy logical T gate. So before I explain how we're gonna find the quasi-probability decomposition, I first want to uh, talk a little bit about how we can try to even realize a noisy logical T gate. So there's of course a lot of different possibilities. In our work, we studied two of them in, in further detail. So in, in, in the first variant, we, we, we for example, considered uh, looking at some state preparation circuit, which uh, prepares some noisy magic state, which you can then uh, insert with the standard uh, injection circuit, injection gadget into your program. And because the, noise, the magic state itself is noisy, the realized T gate itself is obviously also gonna be noisy. And the second variant is more for, for surface code type setups. So here, for example, it considers a kit type type surface code. And the idea is that we want for temporary amount of time shrink the upper boundary of our uh, surface codes to have uh, weight one, right? By basically measuring the correct stabilizers, which will allow us to realize our logical T gate by just running a physical T gate on this top left qubit over there. And then we immediately revert back to the original code. And because for a temporary amount of time, of course, the, the Z distance of our code is, is reduced to one, this is not fault tolerant and we're gonna catch some type of Z type logical errors. And in both of these cases, uh, we can nicely twirl our noise such that we end up with a, a, a logical uh, noisy T gate, which has uh, precisely Pauli Z type noise with a noise strength uh, that I call epsilon bar here. So um, in, in the first variant, you could do this, for example, by twirling the noisy magic state with the Clifford A gate, which gives you a state which is diagonal in the, in the, in the magic state and uh, some state orthogonal to the magic state. And if you look at how this noise propagates through the gadget, it gives you exactly a Pauli Z type error. And on the right-hand side, 
you can do a similar game. You can think of your, of your uh, noisy T gate being an ideal T gate followed by some Z type noise. You want to Pauli twirl that Z type noise. And then you use the fact that the T gate is in the third level of the Clifford hierarchy, which allows you to exchange the, the twirling gate and, and the T gate. Long story short, you can do a twirling that looks something like this, which again gives you exactly Pauli Z type noise. And I'd like to stress here that the, 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 big, the big point is that we're doing this twirling purely with Clifford gates. And we, we, we can realize this Clifford gates fall tolerantly, which allows us to tailor our noise precisely to get this Pauli Z type noise. So why, why is it so important that our, we can tailor our, our, our noise to, to be of Pauli Z type? It means that we can uh, find a very simple analytic form of our quasi probability decomposition. In fact, we can write our ideal T gate in terms of the noisy twirl T gate and the noisy twirl T gate followed by some Z gate. And the, the gamma factor of this decomposition is precisely one over one uh, minus two epsilon bar. So the, the great thing about this is uh, that if you want, now want to do this quasi probability simulation, we only have to figure out one single noise parameter, this epsilon bar. It's not like the, the, the regular settings for probabilistic error cancellation where we have to do tons and tons of tomography of, of, of complicated noisy devices. Here we only need to figure out one noisy parameter and, and, and we're set. And in fact, uh, there are some very simple protocols how you can try to, to, to find this epsilon bar in, in, in practice and experiment. So you could, for example, think of preparing some kind of logical plus state applying the, the twirled noisy T gate uh, 8K times, or K is, is a natural number. And then you measure again in the plus minus basis. And if you plot essentially the, the expectation value of that measurement outcome versus K, you will get a nice exponential decay. And by measuring the basically doing exponential fitting and finding the decay rate, you can efficiently estimate epsilon bar. Now, since we're doing probabilistic error cancellation, of course, we have to pay a price of, of sampling overhead again. We have to run more shots of our circuit. And uh, since we're essentially only error mitigating the T gates, now the, the sampling overhead that we have to pay is exponential in the number of T gates that we have in our, in our circuit. So we can do a simple back of the envelope calculation to try and figure out how many T gates does the sampling overhead allow us to realize. So first of all, we notice that we can write the, the, the logical error rate of our, of our noisy T gates uh, in first order to be proportional to the physical error rate. This is precisely because the realization of the noisy T gate is not fault tolerant. And if we now fix how many shots we are willing to run of our circuits, uh, which is equivalent to uh, fixing this gamma to the power of two times number of T gates, right? Um, the, the number of, of, of actual T gates that we can realize will scale as some constant divided by kappa epsilon. So I think this, this uh, plot here nicely summarizes everything. When the physical error rate that we have on our hardware decreases, the number of T gates that we're able to realize with the methods uh, increases, obviously. And also when we're uh, willing to run more shots of our circuits, the number of T gates that we can realize will also increase. And the number of T gates for realistic numbers uh, uh, is somewhere in the ballpark of thousands to ten thousands, maybe. So at this point, I'd already like to get to the summary of my presentation. So uh, the the central idea is was that we took some noisy logical T gate and we used based, uh, error mitigation techniques, probabilistic error cancellation, to mitigate the noise away, which allowed us to get rid of magic state distillation or these kinds of techniques to to reach universality. And one big advantage of of this uh, compared to regular probabilistic error cancellation is that we have a very simple noise characterization. We don't have to do any kind of complicated tomography and understand precisely how the noise works in our hardware. We only needed to find this one single noise parameter. So I think this table really nicely summarizes everything. So the advantage of our quasi-probability assisted quantum error correction is that we don't require this, this magic state distillation. That means we're more hardware friendly in, in that sense. And the price that we pay for that is that we have to pay a, a sampling overhead, which is exponential in the number of T gates. So this is actually kind of reminiscent to classical simulation algorithm. Classical computers can also simulate Clifford plus T circuits with the overhead, which is exponential in the T count. And I believe the best known algorithm today has this 1.316 uh, basis of, of, of that overhead. And basically, if you want to improve that basis, the only way how you can do it is by just finding a better simulation algorithm. Whereas in our case, the basis of the overhead really depends on the physical error rate on your chip. And even for very realistic values of physical error rates, uh, that the basis seems to be 
by our back of the, of the envelope calculation much, much smaller than what classical simulation algorithm can perform. So this really gives a hope that these kinds of techniques would allow us to, to reach, to, to simulate circuits which are uh, way out of the reach of, of, of classical computers. Okay, so I think my time is running out. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd love to take them now or any time during the conference. Thank you, uh, Christoph, for a very nice talk. Please come up to the mic to ask questions. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, the um, the parameter you need to estimate the noise, is that um, different for, is it more difficult for different types of hardware or is it the same difficulty for different hardware? No, it's... Um completely hardware agnostic in the, in, the, in the way how the theory is formulated. Yes, it will not depend on the hardware type. Cool, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. I have a question about the noise turning. So uh, if you have a general noise channel, when you uh, like do a topology turning, you will have like X, Y, and Z noise. So I'm, my question is why here you only have a Z noise on your T gate? Uh, that's a very good question. So let me maybe get back to the slide. Um, essentially, so uh, for, for example, in, in the surface, in the second variant, the reason why you only have Z noise is because the X distance of your surface code stays large during the whole process. I mean, you don't pick up any uh, X type uh, uh, logical errors, whereas you do pick up Z type logical errors. Whereas uh, in, 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 the, in the first variant, it really also has to do with the fact that we look for a very precise uh, state. This would not work for an arbitrary gate. I think it, yeah, yes. Yeah, thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question about twirling as well. So like, wouldn't twirling require uh, short slash repetition as well? Where is that factored? Because I see your complexity only as a function of number of T gates. So in other words, how fast does this twirling converge? Because like clearly this is on average, right? Uh, you, you don't have to, to actually uh, pay more, uh, like do more sampling due to the, the twirling. You can think of integrating the twirling into the quasi probability decomposition. And essentially because the twirling is, is like a probabilistic mixture, it doesn't increase your gamma factor. So actually, the, you, you don't pay any additional sampling overhead for the twirling. OK, thanks. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any estimates how, how well your, your noise characterization, characterization needs to be in order to achieve like a certainly good, good approximate um, unitary? And, and do you know like how that, I mean, how, how well do you approximate some unitary gate given a certain like error in the tomography? Uh, so are you asking generally for probabilistic error? Uh, just for probabilistic error, yeah. Um, I, I would have to think about that. Okay. So of course you, you need very good quality. That's one of the big issues yeah. why probabilistic error cancellation right. doesn't work in practice. It's exactly what you're saying. You need very good quality uh, uh, mm -hmm. Estimation. I, I, I don't have uh, on the top of my head like yeah. a, an argument to what uh, level of yeah. quality you need it, but um, so I, I would have to think about that. Would you expect that like once you have some 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 issues with the or some mischaracterizations that that everything would just blow up, or do you think there's some hope to like at least get better approximations, well, better gates? If 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 the characterization is only a little bit off, right, you will still. Uh, you, you will not remove the noise, you will re reduce the effect of the noise still. So uh, I, I think it's, it's... But you would still have like an, maybe an exponential number of terms that you need to sum together to get the, you, to get the gate, right? Exponential number, sorry? Uh, of terms to sum together to like in this decomposition of the unit approximately. Right, unitary. this doesn't change, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay. Maybe no, you yeah, can take it later. offline yeah. later Thank on. You. Let's thank uh, Christoph again. 